Hi everyone, how are you? I'm Eric from Lonesome Reader and like so many people I'm caught up in the excitement of the event of Michelle Obama publishing her memoir Becoming. Uh, this week uh, she's going to be interviewed by Oprah and she's on the Oprah's book club and uh, she's going to be doing an event at the South Bank Centre in London where she will be interviewed by, get this, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie and I was so excited to go to this event and it's like a one-time event at the South Bank Center and uh, but unsurprisingly it's a very popular event so uh, when I excitedly went on to try to book tickets immediately when booking opened on their website I was number 21,000 something in the queue, uh, so I don't think I'm going to be able to get to that. But nevertheless, I am still like so thrilled about the book's publication, and I'm so happy that I read it. So let me tell you why. And I'm not excited just because she's a former first lady who is also an icon in her own right because she's done such great things for the community and the country or just because of her historic importance as the first African-American first lady who is the great-great-granddaughter of a slave. And not just because this book finally gives insights into her private thoughts and feelings on a whole range of subjects from her evolving romance with Barrack to the painful transition to the current presidency uh, after they left the White House. And I'm not even just excited about this book because I have silly fantasies about what it would be like to be Michelle's best friend and closest confidant. And listening to this audiobook uh, for 19 hours and 3 minutes of having her speak directly into my ear, like simulates that feeling. No, why I'm so excited about this book is because I need a dose of wisdom and optimism in a period of time when the world seems so bleak and I feel these like encroaching feelings of cynicism creeping over me. So I've only just finished the amazing journey of listening to this audiobook and I'm overcome with emotion and admiration and more hope because of the insightfulness and the heartfelt openness of Michelle describing her journey. I mean, this is someone who has been put under such brutal public scrutiny because of who she is and what her position is, uh, but I love how she emphasizes the importance of telling our own stories and like through her story she says how, I love this quote, she says uh, she is slaying the caricatures and stereotypes with my own words. I love that quote. So she tells the story of her life from her childhood up until the point of moving into a new home after leaving the White House and through this she shows her qualities as well as her flaws and her triumphs and her disappointments, her difficult compromises and forthrightness of being a girl who was brave enough to stand up and talk back to her cantankerous grandfather uh, when he was being abusive towards her grandmother, um, even though in retrospect she realizes that he was grappling with his own disappointments in life. And she also reveals her self-doubt. Throughout the book she continuously asks the question, am I good enough? And by doing this, I feel like she restores the humanity which the media and tabloid scrutiny have taken from her. And I think this is really important because I was just at a book prize ceremony this past week and when a nonfiction award was being given out, the presenter said how he hoped the greater diversity of nonfiction being published these days would hail the death of the celebrity memoir. And of course I'm all for like a greater diversity of nonfiction coming out and I'm sure there's a lot of sensationalist celebrity memoirs which really aren't worth our time. But I think the real excitement surrounding the publication of Michelle's memoir is real 
an, an indication of how we are desperate for a very intelligent role model who has such a had such a significant impact on our cultural and political history. Let me give you one of my favorite quotes, and it's why I find this book so inspirational. She writes how so many of us go through life with our stories hidden, feeling ashamed or afraid when our whole truth doesn't live up to some established ideal. We grow up with messages that tell us that there is only one way to be American, that if our skin is dark or our hips are wide, if we don't experience love in a particular way, if we speak another language or come from another country, then we don't belong. That is, until someone dares to start telling that story differently. And so this book gives us a story which we are dying to hear and that tells a different story. Right, so what are my favorite parts? Well, there's a lot of them. I found it so fascinating reading about her childhood growing up in Chicago and how her neighborhood slowly emptied out of white and more affluent families when it was demonized as a ghetto and how she, uh, her academic achievements um, allowed her to go to a really well-regarded school, but how over time she realized that there was an African-American elite and Jack and Jill club. Uh, so like I found this particularly fascinating because I read a few years ago Margot Jefferson's memoir called Negro Land in which she um, talks about these issues and this um, these divisions in the African-American community and there's a lot of parallels between Michelle Obama's story and Margot Jefferson's story because they're, they're centered around the same time and place of Chicago in the 1950s and 60s. Um, so if you find this subject interesting, I would really like encourage you to read this memoir as well. Another insight from this period of Michelle's life, which I think she encapsulates so well, is how she learns from this that um, there are the apparatus of privilege and connections, what seemed like a network of half-hidden ladders and guide ropes that lead into the sky. And this is a way of describing how there are these secret privileges uh, which exist from smaller communities all the way up through the mechanisms of government. We discover how she learned to play the piano from a young age, uh, about her father's disability, uh, he suffered from multiple sclerosis, uh, about how she would go to the movies to see the Planet of the Apes films, uh, about uh, how she was good friends with a daughter of the Reverend Jesse Jackson uh, for a time period and how this was her first brush with politics. About the pain of breaking up with her first important boyfriend when she moved away to go to college at Princeton. And there's all these wonderful little personal insights into her life like how she uh, in, she loves the, the tidy triumph delivered by a home makeover show. The panic of re-election night when uh, sh her phone goes out of service, uh, so when she's sending messages to get updates and she doesn't receive any replies, she assumes it's it's the worst and Barrack hasn't been uh, re-elected for, for the White House. And how uh, one, on one evening she sneaks out of the White House with one of her daughters to look how the White House is illuminated with rainbow lights after the uh, Supreme Court passes a law that allows same-sex marriages and about her brush with uh, famous figures in the world like chatting about uncomfortable shoes with Queen, Queen Elizabeth and meeting Nelson Mandela and what he said to her and she reveals how she's someone who's not naturally drawn to politics. And then there's also just like humble things she talks about, like the, the pleasure of being home alone at, and making cheese on toast. And of course, there's all these wonderful insights into her relationship with Barrack and how they met. So uh, she, she first met him when she was assigned to be his mentor at a law firm that she worked for, even though she's uh, three years younger than he is. 
and uh, how she was uh, disappointed because he was late for their first meeting and how she told him off on that first meeting for smoking cigarettes. How Beric liked to spend any spare change he had on buying books and how he reads political philosophy just for pleasure. And there's all the romance of how they first got together, like how on a business trip to go see a production of Les Miserables, they both really weren't enjoying it so they left at the interval and how they had their first kiss over um, having some ice cream together and how she got him to watch Sex in the City for the first time. And there's all these wonderful insights into how their different personality types complement each other. So where she's very fastidious and fast paced, he's very laid back and patient. And how they had different views on marriage and how she found living with someone with a strong sense of purpose took some getting used to and it's also really powerful how she speaks about her miscarriage and her IVF treatments. Also she describes the difficulty of balancing a family and a work life and how this leaves her feeling like she's only doing things half well and this is something I've heard described by so many of my female friends. So this book is filled with specific but very relatable details and I think this is great because it shows her to be a much more dynamic person than I think a lot of people give her credit for. So one of her platforms as First Lady was to uh, decrease rates of obesity in children and encourage nutrition. And she starts a garden at the White House, uh, but she reveals how, you know, she's she really enjoys uh, Chipotle and uh, McDonald's cheeseburger from time to time. And of course she does, like so many people do. Uh, but rather than see this as a contradiction, I think it just makes her more human and shows how she's trying to make a real conscientious effort uh, to be healthier and more nutritious herself, as well as encouraging like healthier school lunches across America and trying to lower the sugar content in mainstream foods. And she explores how many of her initiatives grew out of a really personal place in her life, uh, from her establishing a mentoring program for uh, girls and young women, uh, to speaking out um, to, to try to encourage more gun control laws, um, to establishing a spoken word and poetry evenings at the White House uh, to try to encourage children to be more interested in the arts and how Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, spoke at one of these events and workshopped an uh, early version of what would become uh, his musical Hamilton. It's interesting the way she captures how being a first lady isn't technically a job and she had no executive powers, uh, but she describes how she had soft power uh, to inspire and create change through what she says and her actions and through her demeanor. And of course this comes with a lot of ridiculous unwanted things like the public's obsession with her clothes when she just wants to focus on issues. And she points out how every woman in a position of power really needs a team around her of a stylist and a hairdresser and a makeup artist. And she describes how um, she says this is a a built-in fee for our societal double standard. So whereas Barrack only needs to like worry about wearing a suit, um, people really focus a lot more on her looks. So she shows really powerfully how she's aware of the privileges and responsibilities of her position and demonstrates how she handles this with strength and intelligence and faith and how her optimism is really a kind of faith. For all these reasons, I found this memoir so inspiring and insightful, and I don't want to spoil the end, but she does mention towards the end how she has no intention of ever running. Uh, but we can only live and hope that one day maybe we will have Michelle as president, and if not her, then someone as optimistic as she is. So let me know what you think if you've read Becoming. I would love to discuss it with you in the comments below. Uh, and thank you for watching and I will speak to you again soon. Bye everyone.